Hey guys, Super Horror Bro Mike here, and in today's video, we take a journey through a nightmarish playcare as we explain the story of Poppy Playtime Chapter 3. This video will walk you through the events of this latest chapter in Mascot Horror Mayhem step by step, with a little theory talk along the way. So with that said, sit back, relax, and let's recap the events of Poppy Playtime Chapter 3. During the final moments of Poppy Playtime Chapter 2, our protagonist boarded a train out of a game station which would take them to the safety of the world above. That is, until Poppy Playtime herself decided she needed to keep them around to right the wrongs that occurred within the Playtime Co. factory, diverting the train's trajectory and sending our hero hurtling down a one-way track toward the playcare, at which point the train crashed and they passed out. Waking back up, the protagonist finds themselves being carried by a creepy new bigger body's experiment known as Catnap, who deposits them down a garbage chute into the waste disposal. Picking themselves up, our fearless explorer realises they have but seconds to escape the garbage compactor before they are pancaked. After doing so, they make their way through the back rooms of a waste disposal area, catching glimpses of Catnap along the way who seems to be stalking their every move. Eventually, they reach a room with a ringing phone, but who could this mystery caller be? Upon picking up the receiver, we are greeted by the sound of a child's voice. The child sends the protagonist a battery, which can be used to charge up the power point on the wall, unlocking the exit. After leaving this room, they encounter the smouldering wreckage of the train that derailed during their escape from the game station. The child introduces himself as a little boy named Ollie. He explains that Poppy needs the protagonist to help stop the evil at work within the factory but warns that Catnap, the last of the remaining smiling critters, will try to stop them at every turn. Play Kira straight ahead. It's the home of Catnap, one of the smiling critters. There used to be eight of them, I think. Now it's just him. Play Kira is his church, his hunting ground. Oh, and by the way, my name is Ali. Nice to meet you. The protagonist then boards a Skyrail, which travels them directly into the heart of a playcare, located within an enormous sky dome situated in a cave deep below the factory above. While riding the Skyrail, we hear a welcome message from Playtime co founder and master inventor Elliot Ludwig, who recalls his grand ambitions for this place. These children deserve to smile, they deserve to love, and they deserve. A safe home. That is why it is with enormous pleasure that as the founder of Playtime Co, I announce... Playcare! Our very own on-site orphanage. Elliot created the Playcare as an idealistic orphanage for children without a place to call home. Everything a growing child could need is found here aside from natural light. There's a school, a playhouse, a toy store, and a counsellor's office where children could speak to adults in times of need. At the top of the playcare stands Home Sweet Home, the orphanage building itself, where the children would retire to their beds by night after a long day of play and learning. In the centre of the playcare are a series of statues featuring the iconic Smiling Critters. These were smiling mascots who once had their very own TV show, as well as a line of plushies that expelled a soothing scented spray when their drawstring was pulled, helping children around the world gradually fall to sleep. However, news reports spoke of how one toy in particular, Catnap, left children with horrific nightmares, and was swiftly pulled from production. 
Now, with controversy growing, Playtime Co. has announced the recall of all catnap toys from the Smiling Critters line. His image cleared from all promotional material. But damage already done, will disappearing be that easy? The exact cause of these incidents still unknown, only one thing appears glaringly certain. Your children are not safe with catnap. It seems the catnap plush may have accidentally gone into mass production with the red smoke as its scented spray. The red smoke was a sleeping gas used on the orphans within the playcare facility and expelled by the living version of catnap who resided here. It was incredibly potent and sent the children into a deep sleep. From a VHS tape found near the beginning of the chapter, we learn that this red smoke caused certain children to hallucinate and have vivid nightmares, as well as becoming sick, much to the dismay of their carers. Catnap had the red smoke in the room. Then suddenly, there was this scream. <sighs> Nightmares happen, I know, but this, I mean, dilated pupils and quivering lips. The way her eyes darted around the room, and I swear, her hand and mine, it felt like her blood was beneath her skin. The scientists at the facility were using catnap and the red smoke to put the orphans under their care to sleep, then conducting horrific experiments, turning them into the horrifying living toys we now encounter as we journey through the desolate factory. More on that later. Below the smiling critters statues is a room where Ollie is able to send keys for the protagonist to collect up so they can unlock various locations throughout the playcare. First stop is the gas production factory, where the red smoke is produced. Ollie explains that this red smoke must be diverted in order for our hero to continue their journey into the depths of the facility. All that gas you see coming from the machine is made right here in the factory. It's called the Red Smoke. Right now, it's all headed off to the right. We need to make that Red Smoke go left instead. That's how we can get to him. Mission in hand, the protagonist sets off to connect up the power grid within the factory and begin diverting the gas to clear a path forward. En route, they discover a new upgrade for their grab pack, a purple prototype hand labelled for grab pack 2.0. This new hand allows users to jump high in the air when making contact with purple plates. And it also allows for far greater reach, which comes in handy when trying to connect up circuits throughout this new area. Using this new upgrade, the protagonist makes their way through the gas production zone and hooks up the power. However, after turning on the machine, the power cuts out and we are plunged into darkness. Ollie explains that someone has cut the power and so instructs the protagonist to return to the playcare and enter the home sweet home orphanage. There they can restore the power using the backup generator. Upon entering the home sweet home orphanage, our hapless hero is inadvertently exposed to a high dosage of red smoke and finds themselves trapped in a hallucinogenic nightmare. While exploring the haunting hallways of the orphanage, we come across a series of creepy radio broadcasts, which tells the story of the mangled body of a child discovered at the home of Elliot Ludwig after his passing. It is unclear whether this body was planted to deflect attention away from the nefarious goings-on at Playtime Co. and to set up Elliot Ludwig as a fall guy, or if this pioneer of children's entertainment wasn't really the sweet old man he was once portrayed at. It's sickening. Elliot Ludwig was a great man, and those who knew him understood that he was not capable of violence, let alone what others now claim. He had a deep love in his heart for children like this one, making the actions of whoever planted this body all the more sick. We look forward to clearing his good name, both in the public eye and in the eyes of the law. While navigating this nightmare, the protagonist periodically runs into Catnap as he stalks the halls, never attacking, but rather ominously watching their every move. Eventually, they reach a room with a VHS tape. 
the tape seems to be speaking directly to the protagonist, hinting that they were once a worker at the factory who is now returned to be haunted by the very inhumane experiments they once helped create. And should you come back years later, your conscience finally getting the better of you, may you descend into the dark and the dust Finding all that awaits you are incomprehensible horrors, each hungry for your return, each eager that they might find you. Or perhaps they won't allow you such time to figure your place in the world you'd left, a world that's theirs now. Welcome home. At the end of this recording, a nightmare version of Huggy Wuggy crawls out of a television screen and chases the worker down. However, this was simply an illusion. After being eaten by Huggy, the protagonist awakes within the playhouse unscathed and continues onward in search of the backup generator. It isn't long before they come across a new piece of kit, this time a very handy item indeed, the gas mask which allows them to navigate areas flooded with that intoxicating red smoke. Using wind-up race cars to clear debris and batteries to power up doors, the protagonist begins making their way into the depths of the orphanage. In one room they discover Kissy Missy, who sits on a bed cradling a photograph of a little girl in her paws. It seems this little girl is the child now trapped inside Kissy's bigger body an experiment of a play care, who met a fateful end at the hands of the scientists and now lives on as a giant toy. However, unlike Huggy, Mommy and Catnap, Kissy seems docile and does not pose a threat. We find further evidence of the experiments the scientists conducted on the orphans of the play care when unearthing this VHS tape. On this tape, we hear a scientist designate an experiment number to a child called Kevin, who he refers to as a subject. However, the scientist's log is interrupted by another child who questions what is going on, and then must be reassured that everything is okay. Though highly irregular, we've pulled him from the home sweet home just before lights out to perform- What are you doing with my friend? I, what are you doing out of bed? How did you get in here? Is Kevin sick? Why did you take him away? I, I, yes. Kevin is very sick. Very, very sick. But we want to make him better. But he can only get better if we take him to where we can provide proper care and give him proper rest. In the Home Sweet Home building, we find more and more evidence of the nefarious goings on at Playtime Co. Giant rotating statues with inbuilt cameras that monitored the movement of the children one-way glass windows for observing sleep patterns and changes in behaviour, and sanitation stations for caring for those who had fallen ill as a result of exposure to the red smoke. Eventually, the protagonist locates the backup generator and restores power to the play care. As they leave, they are jumped by a familiar face. No, no! Let go! They didn't do anything wrong! We're actually here to help. <sighs> this place makes her tense. I'm glad that Ollie could help you get this far. He's the reason we found you at all. You deserve an explanation. Come on. Poppy explains that she doesn't mean them harm, but she does need their help to stop the monsters that have tortured them. She explains the monsters didn't act alone. They were driven by the influence of a mysterious entity, Experiment 1006, also known as the Prototype, an entity who claimed the remains of Huggy Wuggy and Mommy Longlegs to assimilate them into its own body, absorbing their consciousness in the process. Poppy explains that the Prototype was in fact the creature who locked her away for so very long in the case where we first found her. The prototype knows we're coming by now. You try to escape, he'll kill you before you ever reach that front door. He's the reason I was trapped in that 
god-awful case for so long. You have no idea of the things he's done. Let me help you kill him. Let me help you save everyone. We've all seen you, how capable you are. You killed Huggy. You killed Mommy. You freed me. You are perfect for this. Catnap is coming. He's the final obstacle the prototype has placed against us. We can't stay here. Keep yourself safe. Ollie will call you. After descending back to the playcare with the power restored, Ollie gets back in touch to explain the whereabouts of our next destination. He sends the protagonist to the schoolhouse to turn on the backup generator there. Once inside the school, Ollie tries to warn the protagonist of an entity residing within, but his signal is cut short before he can go into detail. We then hear a surprisingly chipper voice call to us over the intercom. This is Mr. Light speaking. Please excuse the interruption. Students, remain in your seat until the bell has rung. And no going in the halls without a hall pass. Wait, I recognize you. Yes, I remember. You used to work here. How are you? Alive. This is the voice of Miss Delight, the last remaining teacher at the school. Miss Delight is a shambling doll who can only move under the cover of darkness, stepping forward as lights flicker on and off. We must maintain eye contact with this giant disfigured doll to prevent her from quickly catching up to us. As we explore the school, we discover a series of notes which explain Miss Delight's tragic backstory. You see, there were once many different versions of Miss Delight teaching within the schoolhouse. She refers to them as her sisters. Find my sisters and I to learn facts across a variety of subjects. However, one day the teachers found themselves locked inside the schoolhouse, and without a food supply, they began to starve. Without children to teach, their minds wandered, and Miss Delight became unhinged. She craft a makeshift weapon from a ruler and pens to defend herself as her sisters began to turn on her. Miss Delight even gave this weapon a personality and named it Barb. Eventually, she lost her mind and believed Barb was speaking directly to her, willing her to kill the other teachers and then feed on their corpses in order to survive starvation. Now she is the last remaining soul wandering these eerily quiet halls. We learn that it was Catnap who sealed the Delight sisters away in the schoolhouse. From a videotape, it is insinuated that this was because Catnap knew these teachers may harm the children of the orphanage after the outbreak of the factory occurred. Please, where are the children? Are they... in the same place as the employees? No. Are the children safe? Yes. Oh, can I see them? No. And that was it. That's all he'd tell me. Probably because he knew I'd kill them all. <laughs> After powering up the generator, Mr. Light attacks the protagonist, who must then use their wits to survive her onslaught. Eventually, after a lengthy chase, they manage to trap the cannibalistic teacher under a shutter, crushing her in the process. After leaving the school, our hero emerges in a network of caves outside the Playcare Dome. Here they discover the third and final upgrade for this chapter, a flare gun. The flare gun can be used both as a way to ward off enemies, as well as lighting a path forward in particularly dark areas. Making their way through the caves, they discover a horrifying sight. Catnap stands before a shrine he has built for the prototype. In fact, this shrine may give us a rough idea of what the hideous entity actually looks like. We see Catnap worshipping the prototype as if he were a god. We learnt why this is via an ARG for Poppy Playtime that released ahead of Chapter 3's launch. There was once a child called Theodore Grambell. He had been selected as a potential candidate for the Bigger Bodies initiative, the process of transferring a child's brain and nervous system into the body of a toy. 
The prototype befriended Theo and then tried to help him escape before he met a fateful end. Unfortunately, during their escape attempt, Theo was injured while using a grab pack. The only way for the prototype to save Theo's life was to return the boy to the scientists they were trying to escape. Unfortunately, this led little Theo to be used in their latest Bigger Bodies experiment, Catnap. As Catnap, Theodore Gramble continued to worship and idolise the prototype and became further bonded to him. This is later confirmed to us by Ollie, who seems to have knowledge of the incident. In A VHS tape shed some additional light on the character of Catnap and his relationship to the prototype. We hear the voice of Head of Innovation, Life Pierre, speaking directly to the creature, who it seems was kept within a prison cell beneath the playhouse when not interacting with the orphan kids. Is his uh, voice thingy still broken? Theo, nobody's gonna save you. This prison is where you belong. We'll let you out here and there to go see the kids in play care, but your home is here. And as for the prototype, his home is in the labs. This is your life now. Get used to it. From this recording, we really get a sense of the neglect these Bigger Bodies experiments were dealt at the hands of the Playtime Co. employees responsible for their creation. The protagonist realises that the only way out of these caves is through the playhouse, an area of the play care Ollie explicitly warned them not to enter. Moments after setting foot in the play care, it becomes obvious why, as they are ambushed by a host of miniature smiling critters, and they are not friendly. To ward off these plushy sized predators, we must use the flare gun to send the critters scurrying back into the holes they crawl out from. After making their way through the playhouse as hordes of smiling critters give chase, the protagonist finally reaches the aforementioned prison block. Here they encounter the last remaining smiling critter from the Bigger Bodies initiative, Dog Day, or rather what's left of him. Prototype is his god, and this is what he does to heretics. These little toys follow Catnap to avoid that very fate. And in return, they are fed. <clears throat> we try to fight it. The prototype's control. I am the last of the smiling critters. Dog Day explains that we are Poppy's angel, brought to this place to save them all. This suggests that it was indeed Poppy who summoned us back to the factory all those years later, promising us answers to the mysterious disappearance of our co-workers. Dog Day urges the worker to leave, but at that moment the mini critters crawl inside his skin and take hold of his body. They then use Dog Day to hunt our hero down as they flee the maze-like halls and crawl spaces of the playhouse. We narrowly escape Dog Day thanks to the Purple Hand, which springs the player across a gap and into the elevator back to the surface. Returning to the relative safety of the Playcare's hub, our protagonist is once again greeted by Ollie, who is able to reconnect after losing signal. Ollie explains that the final backup generator is found within the counselor's office. And so this grand building is our next destination. The counsellor's office was a place where the orphans could come to speak of their troubles, and was also somewhere where they could be sneakily monitored by playtime staff. It also seems that these offices were where the heads of each department worked from, the main base of operations so to speak. While exploring these offices we come across two different VHS tapes. The first is an emergency broadcast, dated August 8th, 1995, where a company-wide danger alert was issued. At 11.01 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, an unknown hostile force was declared present within the Playtime Company facility. 
Personnel are to begin enacting emergency evacuation protocols immediately. The broadcast cuts out, and an eerie message is displayed, which reads, Open the doors. The hour of joy has arrived. The second recording is found in the office of Stella Graeber. Longtime fans will remember that Stella took a job at Playtime Co. and quickly rose through its ranks. Starting on the toy production line, it wasn't long before Stella became a key part of a secret Bigger Bodies initiative experiment conducted beneath the toy factory. Stella was made head of playcare, in charge of looking after the orphans and seeing that those who didn't end up as part of her employees' inhumane experiments found good homes with potential adopters. In this chilling recording, labelled The Hartman Incident, Stella discovers that a child she had set up for adoption with potential parents ended up unavailable after being selected for testing. I understand you want to give Jeremy that home? Yes, and we would like to adopt. Ah, amazing! You'll be perfect for... Oh. What? Well, it appears there's been some complications. Complications? What kind of complications? I... I don't know. Um, the form says... testing. <laughs> what does that mean? Tell us, what does that mean? Miss Graper, we deserve a better explanation than that. Don't you think? You're in charge of all this! How could you not know? And why are we only finding out about this now? I... I don't. I'm sorry. This makes it crystal clear that not all employees at Playtime knew of the horrible experimentation being conducted on the orphans. The regular factory workers who became involved in the adoption program assumed that the children living inside the playcare were being well looked after, with no signs of neglect. This highlights just how secretive and careful Playtime Co. were when it came to covering up evidence of their misdeeds. The protagonist eventually locates the power room, and after rewiring the electrical circuits, is able to get the backup power online. The only way back is through an area of the building filled to the brim with red smoke, and here they are attacked by Catnap, who rips off their gas mask, sending them tumbling into another nightmarish hallucination. During this hallucination, Poppy speaks over cryptic imagery, which confirms our suspicions of exactly what went down at the toy factory. The orphan experiments, the living toys that went rogue and attacked everyone, and the fact that our protagonist themselves was once a worker somehow involved in all of this, now returning to their old workplace many years later. After waking from this trance, Catnap finally addresses the player and instructs them to leave. The protagonist returns to the play care. They hook up the final backup power inputs into the room beneath the statue. Then Ollie gets back in touch to send them a battery which can be used to fully charge the gas production machine and divert the red smoke so they can descend into the prototype's lair and end this madness once and for all. After heading back into the gas production factory, the protagonist attempts to slot the big battery into the power unit and finally drain the gas, blocking their path forward. Just as they do so, Catnap emerges from behind a nearby door and floods the room with smoke. This causes a hallucination, where Catnap transforms into a monstrous demon form. The protagonist quickly races over to a nearby elevator, narrowly escaping Catnap in the process. They then find themselves in a power room, where a mysterious VHS tape is waiting to be played. The contents of this tape reveal a scientist conversing with the prototype. The name of this scientist is unknown, but it does sound very much like Harley Sawyer the man who spearheaded the Bigger Bodies initiative. We learn that the prototype went through vile experimentation at the hands of this scientist, who poked and prodded at it in search of answers. Ready to talk now, are you? I possess... A question. Go ahead. Do you feel anything? This 
question referred to once exactly. You stick us. Beat us. Tear our flesh. Do you feel it? But there is a secret inside you, 1006. Valuable beyond all measure. I cut and prod and burn at it. And I get closer with each session. When the prototype speaks, we hear a well of different voices. This feeds into our theory that this entity is made up from a collected consciousness of many different beings, an amalgamation of different souls, all controlled by the original subject at its core. Could this original subject be Elliot Ludwig himself? It also seems that the prototype is learning just as much from the scientist as the scientist is from it which explains how it was able to cause the outbreak at the facility. Thank you. You thank me? Absolutely. I learn something new about you every day. After learning this information, we run into Catnap one last time. Using the machine at the centre of a power room, the worker must periodically set off steam pipes to scorch the predatory feline as he closes ground. Although not all of these catnaps are real, some are simply hallucinations, and we can actually use our flare gun to tell which is in fact the genuine article. After surviving catnaps advances and fully powering up the machine, the protagonist overloads it with their grab pack hand. This electrifies their hand and allows them to pass the electrical current directly into Catnap as he pounces. Catnap is set ablaze, he staggers to his feet, scorched and dying, and just at that moment, a hatch opens from above and the prototype extends its hand. Initially, Catnap is afraid, but quickly embraces his master's wishes and surrenders to his god. Theodore and the prototype becoming one in the process. With Catnap terminated, the protagonist is finally able to head back down the elevator shaft and power up the gas production machine. With the path ahead now clear, they reunite with Poppy and Kissy in the adjacent room. Here, Poppy finally shows them what went down at the factory all of those years ago, an event that occurred on August 8th, 1995, and was known as the Hour of Joy. I remember hearing every moment of it. It went on so long, so agonizingly long. They tried to hide anything to stay alive. I remember their cries. What's going on? Why is this happening? What are those things? <laughs> Senseless slaughter, that's all it really was. They killed everyone. The guilty, the innocent, didn't matter. All that death didn't fix anything. And then, once it was all over, they dragged those corpses down below where they'd never be found. And they ate the bodies to stay alive. The prototype has to die for this, for everything. Poppy plays a video which shows how the prototype influenced the other bigger bodies' experiments to attack their creators. Guilty or innocent, it made no difference. No one was spared in the bloodbath that ensued. And so, with the truth revealed, it's finally time to head down to the greatest depths of the facility, the laboratory where the prototype himself resides. It's time to end it all. Poppy tells Kitty Missy to lower her and the protagonist down the elevator first, promising to send it back up when they reach the bottom. However, while descending, we hear the chilling cries of Kissy under attack. But it's too late to turn back now. The hatch seals shut behind them, and our intrepid duo are plunged into darkness, leaving Kissy to a fate unknown. We're coming! Just hold on! Come on, come on, go faster! Kissy! 
And with that, we come to the end of this video and a look at the story of Poppy Playtime Chapter 3 Explained. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it both entertaining and informative. And if you did, remember to leave a like, comment down below, and of course subscribe for more horror related content. Thanks for watching, and I will see you on the next video.